It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, it's Tyler here. So, for this video, what I'm going to do is react to the Bible in a series of videos. Now, the Bible is a very, very long book, and so this is going to be one of just many, many videos on why I doubt the Bible. To give you guys some background on my history, I grew up as a Catholic when I was a child. I partake in church, and the Catholic Church obviously, and so I actually have some sort of history with religion back then when I was a child and also when I was a teenager. And when I was a teenager, I looked into the claims of the Bible and decided that the Bible isn't really the true Word of God. And nowadays, when I read the Bible, I read it more as literature and not actual history or documentation. In my point of view, I do in fact believe that the Old Testament is more or less just full of myth, full of songs, full of poems. And I also think that the New Testament, while it's very inspiring with the words of Jesus, I consider it to be half of it as forgery and of course not really reliable when it comes down to the historicity of Jesus Christ. And so this series of videos is not made to the intent to insult anybody, but rather to understand the point of view of somebody who does not believe that the Bible is true. And so without further hesitation, let us begin my personal reaction to the first chapters. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the first 11 sentences of the Bible, it seems as though that there's like a lot of different information surrounding it. For starters, in the first paragraph of the Bible, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. However, when I was looking up the word for God in Hebrew, the word for God is Elohim. Now, the word Elohim refers to one God or multiple kinds of gods, depending on the context. Now, the main reason why I brought that up is because God said this much later on in the book of Genesis during his creation. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have domain over the fish of the sea, and the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and every creepy thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now that part really confused me growing up reading that part, because it seemed as though that God was like referring to other people or other things. Here's the typical apologist answer when it comes to this question. It says right here that first, God may be referring to himself and the angels. This seems unlikely given the rest of the scripture depictions of angels. These beings are presented as servants and messengers, not creators or rulers. Second, 
This could be what scholars call a pearl of self escortation or self encouragement, meaning he's referring only to himself. This only could be referred to the loyal we, something we see used by human kings and rulers when making proclamations or decrees. The third possibility is that God is speaking as a trinity of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. According to scripture as a whole, the full trinity was presented at creation. Genesis 1 and 2 describe the Spirit of God woven over the waters and John 1, 1, 3 reveals that the word Christ was active in the creation of these things. Although this may be a reasonable answer at first glance, let's take a look at it from a historical standpoint. It seems as though, when you look into the details of biblical history, what happens is that you find that the ancient Canaanites actually believe in not just one God, but many many different gods. For example, one of the gods that the ancient Canaanites have worshipped in the past was somebody that's called El. And El also had a wife named Ashura and of course they had like many, many, many different kids throughout history. And one of the gods that they actually gave birth to was a god that the ancient Canaanites called Yahweh. And finally, one of the other gods that the ancient Canaanites had worshipped in the past was actually called uh, Baal, which more or less were like the god of the mountains, and it was also referred to in the Bible in many different occasions. Because of that revelation that I discovered, I no longer see the book of Genesis as the creation of the universe by a single god. I now see it as the creation of the universe by multiple different gods, by an assembly of gods, with like, you know, Baal, and Ashura, and El, and of course, Yahweh, thanks to this whole entire historical stuff that I now know. But let's just say for the sake of argument, that there was like just one God that created the universe, and not just multiple gods, as the ancient Canaanites had thought of back in the past. Well, in Genesis chapter 2, it seems as though that the order in which the universe was created is incredibly different in comparison to Genesis 1. So the question then becomes, well, how does the Bible has contradiction already within the first two chapters of Genesis? The answer to that is very simple. For much of the 20th century, most scholars agree that the first books, Exodus, as well as Genesis, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, came directly from four sources. The Yahweh is source, the Elohim source, the Deuteronomist source, and the priestly source, each telling the same basic stories and joined together by various editors. This is what I don't understand about biblical literalists, especially the fundamentalists, because they always say that the Bible is 100% perfect, that there is absolutely no errors within the Bible. But we do know for a fact, through scholarship and stuff like that, that the Bible was written by many different people, often the people who have different details that perhaps contradict each other. And so what they did in the past was literally have an editor just edit the different versions, the same story, into one big story. And so by its very nature, the Bible cannot just be 100% perfect because honestly, the process in making the Bible literally evolved editors editing various aspects of different stories together. Now, biblical scholars have noticed direct similarities of the first 12 passages of Genesis with an old tablet that was called the Alema Elish. Now, the Alema Elish, also known as the Seven Tablets of Creation, is the Mesopotamian creation myth whose title is derived from the opening lines of the piece When on High. The myth tells the story of the great god Murdoch's victory over the forces of chaos and the establishment of order at the creation of the world. Earlier I mentioned that the word God refers to Elohim, which in fact refers to many different gods, and it's a direct reference to the belief of the ancient Canaanites. And so, 
when I compare this whole entire thing, what you'll find is that the sequence of events of how the Earth was created is very similar to this creation story of the Elim right here. When the heavens above did not exist and the Earth beneath had not come into being, there was Apsu, the first in order, their begetter, and Tiamat who gave birth to them. They had merged their waters together before metal lands had conceived and bread bread was heaped to be found, which was not one the gods had been formed, or had come into being when there was no destinies had been decreed, the gods were created with them. In the article it also states that both Genesis and the Uma Elish are religious texts which details and celebrate cultural origins. Genesis described the origin and the founding of the Jewish people under the guidance of the Lord. The Uma Elish recounts the origins and founding of Babylon under the leadership of the god Mondark. Combined with each work in the story of how the cosmos and man were created, each work begins by describing the watery chaos and the primeval darkness once filled the earth. The light is created to replace the darkness. Afterward, the heavens were made and in them heavenly bodies were placed. Finally, man is created. Now, according to the data, most Americans believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God and that a minority of Americans believe that the Bible is 100% true. Now, for all the Americans that believe that the Bible is literally true or that the Bible is the inspired word of God, can you please tell me if there are examples within the Bible and where the authors clearly have inspiration of other ancient texts that predates the Bible. How is it necessarily the inspired word of God? How is it possible that the all-knowing creator of the whole entire universe decided, hey, maybe the best way to illustrate that I do in fact exist had to be like the fact that I use different sort of stories to construct my own personal narrative. That to me makes no sense. How is it actually like 100% perfect or 100% divinely inspired? Because honestly, like with everything else, man is full of errors. And so sometimes we get inspirations of different works. Let's take for example, Star Wars. Star Wars is probably the most popular franchise in the entire world. However, the fourth episode called The New Hope borrowed some elements of different movies. For example, it borrowed elements of, of course, the movie that was done by Kira Kurosawa called The Hidden Fortress. It borrowed elements of like the old war movies. It borrowed elements of different types of serials and combined the elements together to create one humongous nice movie. Similarly, it's entirely possible that what I've seen so far in my personal studies, that elements of the Bible, not necessarily copy it, but like, you know, found inspirations from different works of different people that existed prior to the whole entire creation of the text. And so, how is it divinely aspired if the God of the Bible probably took elements of like different cultures surrounding the Mesopotamia during that time period that existed long before the Bible even existed. What's also really sad to me is that 40% of Americans are creationists and believe that the book of Genesis is literally true. When I was a Catholic, not once had they ever taught me that the book of Genesis was literally true. And so when I first saw videos of people actually defending biblical literacy with the book of Genesis, I honestly could not believe that there were people like Ken Ham and other kind of people who literally believe that all that is literally true. Even though there's like no such evidence to support the scientific claims of the book of Genesis or the sequences of the events or anything like that. And so I'm kind of shocked right now and completely dumbfounded how stupid, like how many Americans are just that stupid to believe that the book of Genesis is literally true. But anyway, that's my personal reactions to, you know, the first chapter of Genesis. There's going to be more videos in this series where I react to the Bible page by page. And what do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section down below. 
And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't <laughs> trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.